Hey, visionaries, you are now tuned in to the Starts With a Vision podcast, where everything you do in life starts with a vision. If your vision is clear or foggy, you are in the right place. It's time to go take what's yours, because there's a vision only you can see, and a dream only you can dream. And now, your host, Mr. Starts With a Vision. Everybody listening, what's going on? It's Isaiah Fowler, a.k.a. Mr. Suave. And let me say thanks, thanks, thanks. Thank you for your time and thank you for your attention. And we're not about to disappoint you and we are not going to waste your time. Today's guest is Timmy Taya Osinubi. And what I love about today's episode is today is a, um, it's a really, really, really great example of networking and what a podcasting can do for you. And also just the entrepreneurial journey, um, book launches, and you know what to not do during a book launch, what to do during a book launch, what to do to get momentum, what not to do to get momentum, and so many different things um, in, in terms of launching and you know just putting out content. So today's guest is an entrepreneur, um, a digital marketer, of course, but. I just love the story and I just love what's happened to him, you know, and I'm not going to ruin it and spoil it for you guys. But what I do know is you definitely, definitely want to listen to this uh, one, two, three, four times in its entirety, because there are so many different nuggets and gems being dropped in this episode. So I'm not going to hold you up. Here is Timmy Tayo. What's the word, everybody? What's going on? This is Isaiah Fowler, a.k.a. Mr. Suave, Mr. Starts with a Vision. And we got Timmy Tayo, Oshinubi on the line, man. And I want to say this is going to be a dope episode because we talk about entrepreneurship, digital marketing. We talking about the journey, man. We talking about what it takes to really continue to progress in life. And uh, we all know it's not easy, but I know that these stories are, are very, very pivotal and key to your success and your progression. So with that being said, man, Timmy Tayo, how you doing today? Man, it's an honor and and a privilege. I'm, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you so much for having me. No problem, man. No problem. What um, where are you located at? I'm in Clarkston, Georgia, just outside of um, Atlanta on the east side. Okay, okay, okay. And um, how long have you been entrepreneuring, if you will? Oh man, um, I've really been at it. I'd say since about 2004, I originally came to entrepreneurship to escape uh, name discrimination. So mm -hmm. um, I graduated high school back in 2002. I didn't start working immediately. Um, tried to go to school, that didn't work out. And so um, there was a job fair at the community college that I went to, um, St. Clair Community College back in Dayton, Ohio, where I'm from. And so I interviewed for a position at Lowe's Home Improvement in the building materials department. And so the, the HR who was on campus worked at the Beaver Creek Lowe's, but I was trying to work at the Dayton Mall Lowe's. And um, she said she would refer me to there. So I go to the Dayton Mall Lowe's and no holla, mm -hmm. like nothing, like, like, like nothing ever happened. But the other HR told me that I was an ideal candidate. And so in my mind, the job was already mine. I just had to show up and claim it. So I kept coming back, kept coming back. And Brian, it took me six months to get hired on at Lowe's. And then after I got there, I made friends with the HR coordinator who um, let it slip that the HR at the time was the type of person that if she could not pronounce your name, mm -hmm. she did not call you back. Really? Like it, it didn't matter. Yeah. It didn't matter what your resume said. It didn't matter what your credentials were. If your name was anything other than, you know, Jim, Bob or Tom, you were shit out of luck. Mm -hmm. And so at that point in 2004, I was like, you know what? It's 2004. Screw this. I don't I don't have to deal with this. Like I can just go and, and make money online. Mm -hmm. And so that was really um, my intro into the game, trying to get away from working for other people and, and jobs and just, uh, you know, make my own money. Mm -hmm. So what, what happened? What happened after that? What did you what was your first venture venue or what did you venture into? Um, like a lot of people, um, when I went to the search engine and, and typed in make money from home, um, home based business, that type of thought that led me headlong into the warm embrace of no, Amway. No. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Amway was my first. And, and I did that whole racket for a number. Of, I, I've been, you name it, dog. Um, I, I, I've been in most of them. So anyway, I, I, I bombed out on that like a lot of people, but 
through it all, I did manage to develop a very good business acumen. So even though it didn't work out for me financially, those around me would still seek me out um, for help with their business ventures. So one day, this was back in, I want to say 2012, um, I was managing a friend from high school who's a local rap artist. Shout out to Original. Um, I was the wholesale chairperson for the um for GD Rhea, and I know that sounds like a venereal disease, but it's not. It stands for the Greater Dayton Real Estate Investors Association. Uh-huh. So I lived in Dayton, Ohio at the time. So um, that's why it's GD Rhea, it's Greater Dayton Real Estate Investor Association. I was the wholesale chairperson for them because I had did a whopping five wholesale deals. So that made me an expert. <laughs> <laughs> so I was doing that, and I was, um, I was on Facebook, and I was um, trying to book my man for a show. I was um, letting people know about a meeting as well as a property I was listening. And also my mother had just written a book and I was doing some promotion for her. So then it hit me like a cartoon anvil that for as as varied and disparate as all of these entrepreneurial endeavors were, the one thing they all had in common besides me was the use of the Internet for marketing. So I was like, okay, if I'm going to be a digital marketer anyway, I may as well get good at it. But just because of my experience with the gurus and network marketing and the whole thing, I, I was very I was jaded. Right. I, mm-hmm. I was very hesitant to just, you know, go online and trust people. So I was actually really refreshed when I found out that there was an um, accredited degree program in digital marketing. So I went back and I got my bachelor's in internet marketing for me. And I always tell people that because whenever you talk about school, people thought, oh, student loans. Like, listen. That's not the reason you go to school, mm-hmm. in, my, in my opinion. When I made the decision to get my bachelor's degree in internet marketing, I did that because that was the skill set that I wanted for me. Mm-hmm. I didn't go in there like, oh, let me get this so I can go work for Coca-Cola or let me get this so I can go work for 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 Home Depot. That, that was never a part of my thought process. And I think if you go into it with that, you didn't already lost. Mm-hmm. But I knew that irrespective of them other people. I would always need this skill set for my own purposes. So Mm -hmm. I went back and got my bachelor's in internet marketing, graduated in 2015, Mm -hmm. um, came down to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. As you know, you got six months before Sally Mae won her money and um, released a book last year um, beyond buzzwords. And yeah, man, just just been um, on my ground, started the podcast in January. And um, yeah, that's the whole what you call it, 30,000 foot view. (laughs) Got you. Why did you, so you you spoke about school, but my question is, um, what made you not want to go, you know, just get on YouTube and buy a course or something like where course is not that popular or what, how did, how did that make you feel? Well, for my personal, it was two, it was two things, right? One was that I had been, I had, I knew enough to know that I didn't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So because the the great thing about the internet is that there's a lot of great information out there. The bad thing about the internet is that there's also advice overload. So I knew that I was at the point where I could not just, I didn't have the ability to distinguish the real from the fake. Mm -hmm. I knew, and I had already been duped a number of times. So I knew that I didn't know. Also, another factor for me was access to capital. So a lot of these um, higher end courses or these conferences, if you will. So take a take a better conference like a um, a funnel hacking live from mm-hmm. ClickFunnels, right? Mm-hmm. At Full Sail University, they just call that your final project, right? No, no, no fancy titles or nothing. If you know how to funnel hack, like Russell says, and then you know get your diploma. Anyway, funnel hacking live. Um, a, it wasn't around at the time, but funnel hacking live is a grand, right? It's, it's a stack. Just to have your face in a place that don't include your flight, your hotel, Uber back and forth, feeding yourself. After you add all that stuff back in, you're looking at about three to five grand on that conference, depending on where you're flying in from. Right. And then, of course, that's before any packages, because, you know, they have your VIP training packages and those can be upwards of ten thousand dollars. And even though in aggregate. Fifteen thousand dollars is a lot less than sixty, which is what I paid from from my diploma. You, you gotta have, have that money up front, right? right? You, right. you know, Russell Brunson doesn't take financial aid. So, <laughs> in my in my particular case, it was it was the fact that I knew enough to know that I didn't know shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, and I had already been scammed, and so I needed I needed that that credibility factor of okay, 
and don't get me wrong, Full Sail's in it to make money. Please don't think that they don't because they do. It's an expensive ass school, mm-hmm. but um, they, they still have academic standards mm-hmm. that they have to um, adhere to, or else. And if they don't, then they lose their accreditation. Right. So I, I knew that the information that I was going to receive was at at a at a certain level, and also you had the access to capital, which was another reason that I made that decision. Because yes, I mean let's let's get the elephant on out the room. I mean the content is not why. Like I said, the content just learning the stuff. That's not why you go to school. Right. In my that, that you can get the content from anywhere. You can get the content from YouTube. Mm-hmm. You only really go to school for two reasons um is one is access and the other one is the um association more specifically the alumni association Mm -hmm. so for example um if you let's say for example that you want to be on the supreme court been dreaming about it since she was eight now what kind of eight-year-old wants to be on the supreme court i have no idea but screw it it's your dream not mine Mm -hmm. um if you want to be on the supreme court going to harvard or yale might be a good idea know why because all of the Supreme Court justices, literally all of them, went to Harvard or Yale. So not that the University of Georgia doesn't have a fantastic law degree program, but odds of you getting on the Supreme Court going to UGA are slim. So once you, you know, get that access, you also have um, the, the Alumni Association, you have access to people that you wouldn't otherwise have access to. We was talking a little bit uh, on the pre-interview chat. When I started podcasting, I had a certain level of access to people that I probably would not have had if not for a particular professor. Mm -hmm. Her name is uh, Carrie O'Shea Gorgon. She hosts the Marketing Profs podcast. And um, actually, a lot of my early guests, I I literally scout directly from her podcast. Like I would hear her on Carrie's show like, oh, that'd be a good guest. And I reach out to them and they would see that I was connected with Carrie on LinkedIn. And so she kind of lent me credibility and they were more likely to come on my show, which opened even more doors. I mean, because let's keep it 100. I'm Nigerian, and I already told you that before. Name discrimination was one of the reasons I can't keep. I couldn't get a job, mm-hmm. and it's even worse online because you got these hustling ass Nigerians scamming people, talking about they they princes and shit, mm-hmm. and, and, and getting people out of money. So people are very, you know, hesitant to do business with just this random Nigerian. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. And so, right. but because of my proximity to carry. And my affiliation with Full Sail, that kind of brought down that wall a little bit. Uh And so that made it a little bit easier for me to get into other people's networks and then network from there. Right. So you went to Full Sail. You know what's funny? What's that? So did I. That's what's up. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so did I. That's crazy. So did you take the online? The online or were you in person? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The the, the internet marketing course is only online. Like some of them are online and in campus as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Unfortunately, the um, IMBS is online only, which sucked because I never got my tour, bro. Like I I graduated and I went went down to Full Sail to graduate, Mm -hmm. but I have my kids with me. So I literally showed up. Got my diploma and left. Oh, like, I, I never got my tour. You didn't get the experience. Like that. Yeah, I didn't get the experience. So. Okay, okay. So, so um, after you did that, man. So you wrote a you wrote a book, man. Tell me about the book and tell me about you know how you launched it and, and all that stuff. Absolutely. So the book is called um, Beyond Buzzwords, Social Media, Mobile and Other Marketing Buzzwords Ain't the Half of It. And we take a stance on uh, professional education and digital marketing because there there are several schools of thought and you have people. I'm not going to you know, throw nobody under the bus, but th- there's this one particular person in general who said who talks about, you know, all you need is hustle, 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 hustle and everything to take care of itself. And there, there, there's this just this egalitarianism that is talked about on the web and don't get me wrong please don't misunderstand we i'm all for um accountability you are in control of your life and and that you most certainly are responsible for making your moves that being said in my experience there's a little bit more to it than that and and really really boils down to is that we was sick of watching people get scammed Mm -hmm. especially especially younger and older people just get taken advantage of because they weren't really sophisticated enough and they didn't know how to separate the opportunity from the optimism you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and so um at the beginning of each of my podcasts i start with um you know rose colored glasses are off it's time to get real 
Like, mm. that's how I literally start every podcast. And so we wrote the book to just give people an experience of what that's actually like to go through that process. Mm. Because, um, again, without naming no names, a lot of people who are on this whole uncollege movement and screw school and don't get me wrong, you know, student loans is a problem, blah, blah, blah. But a lot of these folks have never actually been through the process. So, you know, that that's like me as a man trying to tell a woman about being pregnant. You know what I'm saying? It's right. like you've never I, I been be, pregnant. Exactly. Like <laughs> I can go to school. I can be an OBGYN. I got three kids. I got three kids by uh, two different women. All three of my children were delivered by a man. Mm-hmm. That being said, even though he, you know, he's he's you know went to school and he's proficient, he don't know what it's like to be on the other side of the table. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, he don't know what it's like to have his belly slit and a, and a person pulled out of him. You know what yeah. I mean? Right. So it's like I just me and my co-author Michelle A. Bassett. She um. She has a master's in internet marketing from Full Sail. We just wanted to give a perspective of people who've actually been through the process because a lot of these people spouting off. They, they've never actually been through the process themselves. And then you make a decision on what's right for you. You know what right. I'm saying? It, we're, we're not here to make it right or wrong. We're not we're not here to we, we just want a complete conversation. Mm-hmm. And we really felt like, um, you know, a complete conversation wasn't being had. It was only coming from one perspective. And we just wanted to give that different perspective. And in terms of launch, man, being on a plantation ain't good because our launch really wasn't as, as good as it could have been or should have been because a at the time we had jobs so we had other responsibilities and b um we wasn't really trying to be fired so Mm -hmm. because at at the space we was at it's like okay you're doing this other shit well you know what i'm saying so um but no we 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 had a decent launch um i don't know if you know montoya uh montoya smith he does a mental dialogue sounds familiar yeah he does a mental dialogue um at at the at the urban grind coffee house urban grind that's my spot yeah, so we actually launched. Well, we had a launch party. Montoya, Montoya had his mental dialogues every. I want to say second, second or fourth Friday. Anyway, Montoya hosted us, and we launched at Mental Dialogue at Urban Grind, uh-huh. and so it was a really good spot because you know Montoya, he does a really good event with his mental dialogues. Uh, shout out to Montoya Smith, and. Um, we launched there and uh, we, we moved the case of books, which was cool. We got some sign ups, but, um, you know, it, it, it hasn't been, you know, I, I'm not a best selling author yet. Right. Yet. But it's, it's been a slow and steady progression. But the book um, opened doors with the podcast. The podcast opened other doors. So it, it's, just, it's been a slow and steady progression. Um, the book came out last March, March of 2016. Mm-hmm. And um, it's, it's, it's been a slow build ever since, but definitely, definitely starting to open doors that I otherwise wouldn't have because now I can say I'm an author, right? right. Now I can say it and I have a podcast and all this other stuff. So now I can talk to people who otherwise wouldn't speak to me. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Let me, let me ask you this. What type of doors open for you after the book was written? Because I want to I wanna illustrate this for people. Absolutely. So um, one of the doors that opened after I um, released the book was that people started asking me to speak at conferences and summits. So because once you have a book, you're really? an ex, right? Yeah, you, you're, you're an authority, right? That, that's the first part of authority is author, right? Mm-hmm. So once I had the book, I, I could actually position myself as, you know, I'm an authority. And just, and just a quick hack for all those um, students listening, you know how I wrote the book so fast? All those assignments from Full Sail, I had already paid for the shit. I mean, so I felt like, well, why not publish it? So I literally took, not all of them, I did a little bit of original writing, but I took all my assignments that I did um, in the 30 months I was at Full Sail, made some chapters out of them, and boom, mm-hmm. I had a book. Right. So anyway, um, that position, it just positioned me as an expert and allowed me to speak with authority on things that I knew about because, you know, opinions are like buttholes. Everybody has one and most of them stink. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, but when you have a book that that sets you apart from everybody else. So from speaking at panels, um, I don't know if you want me to go into it here. We was just um, no, speaking I, before. No, I mean, absolutely. But r- really quick before that, um, you know. Did people reach out to you from your website? Did they say, oh, I read your book and I want you to speak here? What did that look like in terms of the people reaching out to you or you getting? Did you have to pitch your book and say, hey, I wrote this book. Um, can you can you you know let me speak at your event or was it really people reaching out to you after they read you wrote the book? 
both, but mostly sell. I, I, you have to push your book. No, there's no mm-hmm. two ways about that. Right. Um, the book isn't going to sell itself. This whole building they were come that that's complete and utter bullshit. Mm-hmm. Like you, you got it. You got to get out there and push it. That being said, um, people share books. And so I have had um, several people who either um, because I I would send books to certain institutions like whose stages I wanted to get on. So if there was a chamber of commerce, if there was a, a speaking engagement that I wanted to get on, if there was a stage I wanted to get on. I would send out books and I, I definitely pushed it. But I, I have had two or three people um, reach out to me on Twitter primarily and, and LinkedIn saying that they either wanted to have me on their podcast or talk on their show. In addition to hosting a podcast, I've been on six or seven different podcasts. I've been on um, Riot Starters by Tanya Lowe. I've been on the Convince to Convert podcast with Jay Bear. I've been on the Marketing Profs podcast um, from my professor I was telling you about, uh, Carrie O'Shea Gorgon. So um, once it got out and it has some legs to it um it did trickle back to me a little bit but first and foremost absolutely man i, I had to sell it you got to push it um just because you build it they will not come like you have to you got to push your product mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so w- what are some tips that you would give people who are writing a book right now or getting ready to launch their book and you know their self did you self-publish it we did yes okay sir. so you self-publish it so somebody is self-publishing um, you know, really from your experience, what would you give yourself? What advice would you give yourself again if you were going to relaunch it in terms of like pitching your book, selling your book and, and, and using your book as a tool? Don't be scared. Um, Cause like I said, we was, we were still on a, the corporate plantation at the time. So we didn't really have as big as a buildup as we should have because we did, we was afraid of our bosses finding out and firing us. Mm-hmm. Uh, screw that. Don't 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 keep the fact that you're writing a book a secret. That's one of the worst things that you could do as soon as you have the cover. Um, And you don't even have to have the book fully written yet. But as soon as you have the cover and the outline, start letting people know, Um, start getting people to opt in, give away a chapter or two um, and get people's feedback. That way you can actually incorporate their feedback as you go through the writing process because that was a big mistake that we made if i could go back and do it all over again and say you know where did i mess up we messed up because um again we 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 were using someone else's platform we we launched during the mental dialogue so we had some success there but i would definitely um felt like we would have had a bigger splash if we would have let people know uh, a few months beforehand and actually built up the momentum and had a date and had people um, you know, get a chapter or two, give us some feedback about the chapter, do some pre-sales. We didn't do pre-sales. Again, that was a mistake because like, like I said, we was hiding. Mm-hmm. And so we really didn't like push it beforehand. So if you're writing a book and nobody knows about it, shame on you. Mm-hmm. Like everybody should know about it. Literally everybody should know. About it. And you can get a you can get a book cover for a few bucks. You can go to Fiverr. You can go to Upwork. You can, you can reach out to my man, Isaiah Fowler. If you don't already know, if you listen to this podcast, there's several ways you can get a book cover done. And all you need is the cover. All you need is the cover and the outline. That's it. Mm-hmm. And start pushing because that was, man, that, 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 was, that, that, that was the biggest thing for us that where we messed up. Um, another thing that I would say, and we had this part right, but we, we again, it didn't really matter because uh, we didn't have that the top part of the funnel fail. Mm-hmm. Have um, have your funnel um, if you if your audience know that have your funnel planned out. We had a resource site to our book, so every chapter in the book had a corresponding page on our website where people could go and where they can go and get more resources and, and have a way for people to interact with you afterwards. And, and that can be whatever that can be. Uh, leaving a comment on your Facebook page that can be joining your private Facebook group. I mean, there's there, there, there's a million different ways to freak it, but mm-hmm. your, your your book is just the first stop. It's just, it's just to let people, like I said, establish you as an authority and get your foot in that door. But definitely, definitely have have some type of funnel, have some type of follow up, have some way for them to get in, um, get in your your database, your email list, and capture those emails and have an ongoing relationship with you because. Um, I mean, it's hard to make a living off of a twenty dollar book. I'm gonna just put it out there. Like it's a difficult thing to do. But um if if the if the twenty dollar book 
brings you a client, then you know, a twenty dollar CPA ain't bad. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So so definitely, definitely have that back end ready and have a service, um, have a service to sell. Mm-hmm. Because um again, just just making a living strictly off of off of books and even speaking, even if when you get paid to speak, like that that's a hard hustle because very few stages are gonna have you back repeatedly, like year after year. Like if they have you on stage, they might not need you again for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. So it's um it, in terms of annual conferences, that is. Like it might be different if it's like at a at a, like a an AARP or at an association where they have regular events. But generally speaking, you always want to have some sort of service, some sort of funnel, some sort of back end where you really make your money because. Um, you know, and I, I don't know if you subscribe to this, but some people say that a, a book is just a, a twenty dollar business card, and and really it's the it's the it's the top of your funnel. The book is just the top of your funnel, mm-hmm. and you definitely need to um, have have something on the back end where you sell them services or have a higher end product. Right, 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 man. Look, man, you broke that down so 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 good, and I think that people need to listen to that again. Like for reals, from the resources to having the service to sell to having a back end, all that matters. Because a yep. lot of people they write a book and that's it. Yeah, they have nothing. They had no call to action in the book, and because they're they're doing things without thinking about them at all. Mm-hmm. And then they already are self published. They have three people that buy it, and it's their grandma and their uncle. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, what are you yep. going to do? Like, wh- where do you think this book is going to go? You know? Mm-hmm. So, man, that is like, man, that is, you need to write a book on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for real. And, and I know I already said it, not to harp on it, but really do not keep the fact that you're working on a book a secret. And I know a lot of people um, are a little bit afraid of that because um, it introduces accountability. Because they, they, they've been working on it for a while. But now once you put a date out, pick a date. Quit being scared. Pick a damn date. Let the world know. And then be true to your word and put it out on that date. Because here's the thing about books. You can always do a, a second version. You know what I'm saying? You, you can re-release it. But don't get so caught up on being a perfectionist that you have a book in your belly for 10 years and you never get published. You have set a damn date, set a date right now, get a book cover done and put it out there. Because that's like, if, if I, if I had to identify one thing where we messed up, that's what we messed up. No one knew we was writing a book until the book was done. Mm-hmm. But we, we, we hadn't, we hadn't, had a campaign we hadn't we hadn't built up any high we, we didn't do none of that shit because again we we didn't want to get fired and so um that that was a mistake mm-hmm. man that's amazing man well i'm glad you you um you know you learned from it and i'm pretty sure next time you're definitely not gonna do that <laughs> for sure <laughs> for sure absolutely man so what's the what's the future look like for you man what's the future of you and, and, and you know as a digital marker what does that look like for you Man, future is bright. Um, like we was talking about a little bit before, um, just just the progression of everything. So um, I started my podcast in January, and one of my early podcast guests, Sean Thomas, shout out to Sean Thomas, the entrepreneur. Her, she um, was part of Icon Summit, and she brought uh, David T. Fagan to town to Atlanta, who's the former CEO of Guerrilla Marketing. And so during his conference, he brought in a lot of his students, a lot of different guest speakers, um, one of whom was Marcello Thetford. And Marcello Thetford has been acting since literally about 20 years, since 1995. And he starred in several <clears throat> he starred in several productions. He was um, in Dangerous Minds with Michelle Pfeiffer. He was in Red October with Denzel Washington. Um, he's done several cameos on television. He was the first openly gay player on BET's The Game. This is back in 2009 before, um, um, was it, Michael Sam came out and he did a lot of cameos on Sands of Anarchy. Yeah, he and threw it back. Yeah. <laughs> the Game, For real. I remember that show. And I remember when Michael yeah. Sam came out. Man. Yeah. He, 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 Mar- Marcello Thetford's heavy. He's real heavy. So anyway, he was um, one of the people at the summit and we sparked up a conversation and of course he had a um you know he had a PR um package where you get access to his um network and he's pushing you and he's getting you speaking engagements and he's getting you um you know booked on morning shows and etc 
Um, all of the things that I need, because like I already said, you know, I had messed up the book launch. So my, my PR just wasn't where it was supposed to be. And so, um, I was able to I was able to um, reach an agreement with him for where we bartered professional services because, you know, I was at a place in my business. I was still growing. I've only been at it a couple of years or at least since the book. It's been 2016. So it hasn't been a couple of years yet. So it's like I couldn't afford his services. But what I was able to do is I was negotiate um, bartering professional services. So I'm going to do some video editing for him because he owns a production company where he does um, straight to DVD um, movies and he's still going to give me his package where he'll, you know, he'll help me relaunch the book and, and, and push it out and give me speaking engagements and blah, blah, blah. And so this was an opportunity that was is nine months in the making, which nine months ain't that long. y'all. I know it sounds like a long time, but it ain't that long. I, I only have uh, 51 episodes published. Um, and this all came to me via my podcast. And it's really crazy how the progression is, because as we're recording this, as we're talking, I'm about to head, head out to L.A. for the rest of the year. And I'm going to be um, working with Marcello editing movies and um yeah, <laughs> so I'm 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 headed out to Hollywood, <laughs> it, it, all from a podcast. So if you if you if you've been um if you've been on the fence and you've been thinking about podcasting, man, I, I there's nothing I could say to encourage you more. And um this this podcast that you're listening to right now, to what, what, what's this two hundred eighty something two hundred? Listen, <laughs> the man knows what he's doing. OK. Mm-hmm. And so you are you're already in the right place because you're listening to Isaiah Fowler. And so he has a podcast and he's not paying me for this, by the way. He didn't ask me to do this. I'm saying it because I believe it, mm-hmm. because I just gave you my testimonial of how podcasting changed my life. So if you're on the fence, man, um, Isaiah Fowler has a podcast marketing agency. I would heavily, heavily encourage you to give him a call and um, get on the ball because like. He he got damn near three hundred. I ain't even got a hundred. I'm at fifty, <laughs> and I'm already headed out to L.A. Like right. for real, like this is real spit. Like this this happened in real life. Yeah. And so um, that that wasn't a paid endorsement. He didn't. He ain't slipping me no money. Like this this is what actually happened in real life. I'm shocked. So um, yeah, man, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Get on it. Yeah, Get I, on it. I definitely appreciate that, man. But um, we were talking, and that that is a real testimony. Like seriously. Um, because you know the power in it, and I'm just happy for you that that happened to you. Because this you. is Thank that's you. major, and you don't know what's gonna happen from here on out. Right, and that's the crazy part. Nine months. That's it. It's not, I start. I launched in January 2017. Mm-hmm. Ain't even been a whole year yet. Ain't even been a whole year, man. Everybody's journey is different, but these opportunities are awaiting you as well. Absolutely. So yeah, Absolutely. man. So um, how could people find out more about you and contact you? Absolutely. So my Twitter handle is at Timbo8482. That's T-E-M-B as in boy, 80-8482. My podcast is Marketing Disenchanted. You can find it in iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, iHeartRadio, wherever you get podcasts. Um, we release episodes every Tuesday. It's, it's, it's no fluff, no BS conversations about real digital marketing, things that you actually need to know. I ask some really heavy, hard-hitting questions. Just ask my man Isaiah Fowler. Got his episode coming soon. And um yeah, the book is um, Beyond Buzzwords. That's available on Amazon. You can get that at thinkbeyondbuzzwords.com. And then um, if you need any advice on if, if, if you're just starting in digital marketing or you need some career advice, go to digitalmarketingadvisors.com. Happy to help. All right, man. Well, uh, I hope everybody heard that. I hope you, you, you listened up because from from a podcast to a book and that book launch strategy Man, I hope you really got a whole bunch of notes because this was real life gold right here. So, um, you know, with every with all that being said, man, we're about to cut this episode off. That's today's episode. But I appreciate everybody for listening, for tuning in. And we're going to talk to you on the next show. Thanks for listening to the Starts with the Vision podcast. Come get your vision clear at www.startswiththevision.com. See you there.